Hello, and welcome to our latest Future Tense uh, conversation on Agent Sonia, uh, the most consequential um, spy in the history of technology. We have a question mark there, but it's really, uh, this is really gonna be a fun one. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Andres Martinez. I'm the editorial director of Future Tense. I'm also a professor of practice at our Arizona State University um, Cronkite School of Journalism, a picture of which is behind me. Uh, Future Tense is actually a partnership between ASU, New America, and Slate Magazine. And we explore the um, impact of technology on society. You can follow us um, at Twitter, at Future Tense Now. And we've been having a lot of these uh, conversations uh, every Wednesday. We have a great one next week where we launch a new uh, interplanetary podcast that Slate is doing in conjunction with our School of Space Exploration at Arizona State. Um, today is a real privilege, and um, and it's it's sort of indulging my my huge fandom for Ben McIntyre's books, um, and a great excuse to to, to reconnect with our good friend um, Liza Mundy. Um, so uh, Ben McIntyre, as many of you and all of you probably know, um, has been on this amazing pace, we were talking about this earlier, of churning out these incredible um, spy histories over the last few years, and each, with, each one of which I think goes to prove that, that history um, can be more riveting than fiction. Um, I, I, I was barely getting over my stress about the fate of uh, you know, uh, the Soviet um, Gordievsky uh, KGB agent who needed to be exfiltrated from Moscow during at the height of the Cold War, this amazing tale when along came Agent Sonia. So uh, the uh, Ben McIntyre has written many of these books, uh, Operation Mincemeat, Agent Zigzag, um, <clears throat> and uh, The Spy and the uh, Traitor was the previous one to Agent Sonia which again, uh, I think came out a couple of years ago. So I am in awe of Ben's productivity, but also the way in which his books, um, you know, they, you can read them almost as kind of thrillers in terms of the, the pacing and the suspense of the story, but they're also telling, uh, you know, big history with capital B, capital H in terms of uh, the Cold War, you know, whatever the setting is, Agent Sonia kind of, uh, spans the 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 early days the days of Weimar Germany World War II Cold War um, and it's it's history that's very well told uh, meticulously researched um, in addition to really honing in on the sort of intimate ethical dilemmas that people have to make in extraordinary circumstances um, sort of reminiscent of like John Le Carre at his best so kudos to you Ben. Um, uh, as, as a lot of us in, in our Future Tense community, all of us are really into thinking about how to tell, how to use leverage storytelling to convey big ideas and to get at sort of core issues that the challenges that we share. And I think your books do that in addition to being just highly entertaining. Um, Liza Mundy, of course, is a, uh, was the author of Code Girls, The Untold Story of the American Women, Codebreakers of World War II, which was also the subject of a great Future Tense event back when we would do these in, in person. Liza is a, was a very accomplished um, journalist at the uh, Washington Post and is working on a project that is uh, exploring similar subject matter to Ben's book, but I don't wanna, um, that's just a, <laughs> I'll leave that for her to to expand upon. And of course, Liza was is a great, um, uh, a member of the New America community, community as a senior uh, fellow. Now, I, I, before handing off the moderating baton to Liza, I, I do want to say that there's this, there's an interesting sort of um, parochial connection that one of our, you know, Future Tense is this collaboration between Arizona State University, Slate the Magazine, and New America the Think Tank. Um, here in Arizona, uh, Arizona State University plays a role um, and I, we haven't talked about this, Ben, but plays a role in the, an important role in the story, uh, somewhat indirectly, in the sense that um, Agnes Smedley, who is a, a, a fascinating character in this in this book, and I had run run across her in some books about Richard Sorge, who might come up in this conversation. Um, Agnes uh, was a novelist and this great journalist and 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 free spirit who was. Um, 
uh, an important figure in Shanghai in the 1930s. Um, and she is a graduate of Tempe Normal, which was the name of Arizona State University uh, back in those days. Arizona State University, uh, which we now know as the largest public university in the country, and, and asterisk, I have to add, we're in the most innovative university, um, uh, or I get in trouble with my bosses. But you know, we started off as a, a, a territorial teaching institute for, you know, um, for for what for prospective teachers it was a normal college and agnes smedley was here in the 1910s um her and and for those of you who have read the book um it is uh agent sonia you know ursula kuczynski's encounter with agnes smedley in shanghai in the 1930s that uh you know but for that encounter I, i'm not sure you know ben has a book i mean maybe he does but but there's a there's it's a, a historically significant moment, and Agnes's life was uh, independent of Agent Sonia, uh, hugely um, interesting, and was the subject of uh, her biographer Stephen McKinnon um, is a emer uh, emeritus professor in our in our history uh, faculty. He wrote Agnes Smedley, The Life and Times of an American Radical. He co-wrote it with, with his wife, Janice, and the, the Smedley collection is here at Arizona State University. So just uh, as a prerogative for like the uh, the home crowd, I, I did want to mention that uh, intriguing connection <laughs> that our university has with the story. Um, so thank you all for uh, watching this. And um, Ben, I don't usually gush about our, our speakers the way I, I have today, but um, huge fan. My high school son and I listened to your your previous book on a on a road trip that we took across the country um, last summer, and and he enjoyed it greatly too. So thank you for doing this for us. And Liza, as always, I'm I'm excited to to listen to you um, moderate this conversation. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Andres. Uh, and I'll continue to shower Ben with praise, but eventually we'll let Ben actually talk. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, just, um, I hope that if you haven't already read his book, I hope that you will order it and read it because it is absolutely fantastic. You can see all my post-its at the top here. Uh, so it's an honor to share this digital podium with you, Ben. And, um, and one of the things I really appreciate, uh, one of the many things I appreciate about your book is the, um, the subhead is Mos Agent, it's Agent Sonia, Moscow's most daring wartime spy. Uh, and so your publisher didn't feel the need to qualify it by saying most daring wartime female spy uh, and and gave her, you know, sort of full place as um, as the most daring spy. So uh, so thanks for that. Um, but it, gender is threaded throughout this book in the most wonderful way, the way in which, ironically enough, being a woman served her very well, both in her spying and in her um uh, successful attempts to evade uh, being found out and and arrested. Uh, and so we will talk about spying and technology, and we'll also necessarily talk about gender, which is just absolutely wonderful. And what I what I also so much love about this topic is those of us who talk about women in STEM, as I do sometimes, sometimes talking to you know young girls to get them excited about women in STEM. We talk about uh, the fact that usually when we talk about this, we mean women's contributions to the development of technology, to developing it or um, you know, form, forming technology in some way. And, and a lot of our modern STEM technology did, uh, the, the origins can be traced particularly to World War II when we were developing computers, we were calculating ballistics and trajectories, uh, developing mm -hmm. nuclear weapons, radar, so much technology came out of World War II. And because the men were all fighting, women were called in uh, to the burgeoning beginning STEM sector to help develop early computers or break codes. Um, and, and we're starting to understand this, I think, in the United States, uh, recognition, more and more recognition for Grace Hopper, Admiral Grace mm -hmm. Hopper, who was designing computers for the Navy, uh, women software programmers who were, uh, who were programming the computers for the Army's ENIAC project. And then, of course, hidden figures, uh, the Black female mathematicians, some of whom came in during the war and then afterwards 
were during the Cold War. So we're getting a sense more and more of women's contributions to the making development of technology. Um, but espionage was also uh, a field that expanded during World War II, this global war, this, you know, taking place on all continents, the need for new secret agents. And so this is another sector where women were invited in, uh, the OSS in the United States, the SOE um, in England. And, and so it was another um, sector of, of opportunity, a uh, window of opportunity for women. So what we don't talk about is women's role in the passing of technological secrets, which is what Agent Sonia was so um, instrumental in, in doing and, and, and sort of in sharing technologies uh, between allies as well as um, enemy nations. So for those who haven't read the book, and I know this is a tall order, could you just briefly tell us who Agent Sonia was and then talk about first her own use of technology? Was she particularly gifted at the sort of technologies that spies uh, necessarily had to employ uh, before and during the war? Well, with pleasure. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction, both of you. How, how kind of you. And it's delightful to be here, um, or to be virtually here. Um, yeah, women spies, it's a terribly interesting subject. There have been women spies throughout history. I mean, from Matahari onwards, uh, and indeed long before Matahari, the most famous um, sort of woman spy. And I make the claim in this book that, that Ursula was the most influential, the most strategically important woman spy of the century. And that is quite a claim. But I think one has to make a distinction because the women spies that we know about and the ones that we tend to write about are very often agents. They, they, don't they tend to be people who are employed often by men to do specific tasks, to carry messages, to gather information, to code break. Ursula is different in this respect in that she was a trained intelligence officer. She wasn't someone who was just recruited ad hoc and for a particular job. She embraced intelligence. She embraced espionage as a career choice. And she stuck with it for more than a decade. So for her, it wasn't, she wasn't a kind of, she wasn't someone who was being used by men. She was actually perfectly the equivalent of any other man in her service. And, and she rose incredibly high. She became a colonel in the Red Army Intelligence Service. Now, I don't know of a woman who reached that elevated rank in any intelligence service. I mean, let alone the Soviets, who were not famous for their equal opportunities policies. I mean, but I don't know of, of any service where that happened. So it does make her, I think, absolutely unique. And that is a reflection both of her own skill and of the status and quality of the intelligence she was gathering. So just to give you a quick run through of who she was and what she did, Ursula Kaczynski was born in, in Berlin uh, before the First World War, um, she, and she grew up in Weimar, Germany. She grew up in that chaotic period between the wars of great economic dislocation and fantastic political upheaval. When the right was on the march, the brown shirts and the fascists were, were, were beginning to take power, and they were being combated on the left most radically by the Communist Party. Now, Ursula came from a, a prosperous, intellectual, well-to-do Jewish family brought up in Schlachtensee, a very sort of um, comfortable and nice uh, suburb of, of Berlin. She didn't know, as nobody did, that her world was about to be blown apart by the Nazis. But women of her, uh, and men and women of her class and her position, many of them did what Ursula did, which was to embrace communism. She became a communist at the age of 17, and she never looked back. Now, we look at that sort of choice through the prism of the Cold War, and, and we think she ended up on the wrong side of history, which is arguably true. But in order to understand someone like Ursula, we have to realize that from her perspective, the only way of dealing with fascism, the only way to oppose the Nazi brown shirts was communism. They were the only people who were taking it to the streets. And so she was a convicted, conv convinced communist from her earliest, earliest, earliest adulthood. She became a spy by accident, really, as, as most spies do, in fact. She, she went to Shanghai with her husband, who was an architect uh, called Rudolf Hamburg. He was, a, he was a socialist, but he wasn't a communist. Um, she was constantly trying to convert him and turn him into one, um, and indeed succeeded, but that's another story. But so she arrived in Shanghai, where her husband was working as architect, 
And there she was terribly bored. She found the whole thing incredibly dull and she lived the life of a, of a sort of uh, colonial wife giving tea parties and playing mini golf and generally finding the whole thing too tedious for words. And then she met Agnes Smedley, uh, who Andres mentioned at the top of the programme. Now, Agnes Smedley was at that point extremely well known, actually. I mean, she'd written a highly successful novel called um, Daughter of Earth. She was a radical feminist, very much ahead of her time. Um, and she met Ursula. And what Ursula didn't know and what nobody else knew was that, in fact, Agnes had also been recruited as a Soviet intelligence agent in Berlin in the 1920s. She was a paid up spy. And it was through Agnes that Ursula was introduced to another critical figure, a man called Ricard Sorge, who was described by Ian Fleming as being the most formidable spy in history. Quite a claim, actually, but, but actually not that far from the truth. Uh, Sorge was an extraordinary man, and he was the head, he was really the chief Soviet spy in Shanghai, in China at that point. Now, what was happening in Shanghai was a brutal undercover war was taking place between the underground communist movement and the nationalist government of China. And the Soviets were bankrolling and providing weapons to the communist insurgents. And Sorge, first of all, recruited Ursula and then seduced her. And although she was married and she just had her first baby, they had a, a torrid love affair. And in a way, it was the, one of the defining moments of Ursula's life because the inter, intermingling really of the emotional and romantic on one hand, and the ideological and political on the other. I don't think Ursula ever completely untangled them. And she remained, she really loved Ricard Sorge, even though their love affair was very brief. Uh, and she was recruited into the Red Army Intelligence Service. Uh, so so the, 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 the intelligence gathering arm of the, the Red Army. Um, and she began as a courier under Sorge, but she very rapidly ascended through the ranks. Their love affair only lasted um, less than a year, in fact. Um, and and Sorge was then redeployed, in fact, to, to Japan, where he would carry out unbelievable feats of espionage uh, before being hanged by the Japanese. But Ursula was then summoned to Moscow and trained uh, as a proper intelligence gathering agent. And she attended, so this gets us onto the technical aspect here. She was taken to a special spy school outside Moscow called Codenamed Sparrow. Uh, it was actually known as the Eighth Sports Directorate, um, but actually it was the technological center of, uh, for training um, spies. So there are two, there are really, in intelligence, there are two different sorts of intelligence. There's signals intelligence and there's human intelligence. Now signals intelligence is code breaking. Um, it's, it's, it's obviously very dominant these days. It is about emails and text messages and, and, and so on. In the war, it was really about wireless messages. Right. And in Nursery's case, it was about radio technology, it was about learning about using shortwave radio. And she became extraordinarily good at it. I mean, it's no exaggeration to say she could build a shortwave radio out of the stuff you could buy in a hardware store. I mean, it was very dangerous to do, she had to buy it from different hardware stores so you didn't get caught, but she was really good at it. I mean, and then again, that sets her apart. The, the, the whole technological aspect of intelligence, I mean, technology generally, during before the war and during the war was dominated by men, absolutely dominated. And, and as far as I can work out, she's the only graduate of the, spa, of the Sparrow School that went on um, to use this stuff. <laughs> and I'll explain perhaps a little later how she did it. But um, so from Moscow, she was deployed back to China to Japanese occupied Manchuria, where her task was to liaise with the, the communist partisans who were battling the Japanese occupiers of China. It, uh, that part of China. It was incredibly dangerous. I mean, had she been caught, she would undoubtedly have been executed. Well, she'd have been tortured and then she would have been executed, as would the whole of her family. So the stakes really couldn't be higher. She had another love affair when she was in, in Manchuria with her colleague and immediate boss in Soviet intelligence, a man called Johan Patra. She had another baby by him. She would have three children by three different men. Hers was a, was a fascinatingly advanced attitude um, to relationships. Um, and from, I mean, I'm scooting over the story here because don't, I don't want to sort of hold everything up. But so from, from Japanese occupied Manchuria, she then moves to, to Poland on the eve of Nazi invasion where she's running the communist cells, always using her radio to, to send messages back to Moscow. From there, she moves to Switzerland. And Switzerland in many ways is, the, is one of the high points of her career because she built herself a radio transmitter 
and she began to run all the agents that were operating inside Nazi Germany on behalf of the Soviet Union. She was producing a stunning amount of material. Um, and then she ended up in London. Well, first of all in London and then in the Oxfordshire countryside. Her family, her Jewish family had fled from, from, from Nazi Germany. Most of them would be wiped out, the ones that, that remained there, but her immediate family got to London. She joined them. And she ended up living in a tiny village in the Cotswolds, in the rural Cotswolds, in a little cottage with her now three children um, to all intents and purposes, she was Mrs. Burton, a perfectly ordinary uh, refugee housewife, um, going to church every Sunday, even though she was Jewish. No, so she was completely innocuous. What nobody, none of her neighbours knew was that in the privy, in the outside loo, in the back garden, she had built a very powerful radio transmitter. And with that, she was communicating with Moscow, and she was providing Moscow with the blueprints for the atomic weapon which takes us on to the other technological aspect of her story. So that is really the, the high point of Ursula's career, is when she's in a position in her tiny, tiny shed in the back garden uh, to provide, and it's no exaggeration to say that she really was providing more or less chapter on verse, chapter and verse on, on how to build the atomic bomb. So thank you for that. That was Sorry, uh, <laughs> it, it just, um... I would still say to people, read the book, because uh, <laughs> that, that's a wonderful thumbnail of, of her incredible life. Uh, so to, to talk about her own radio transmitting, she not only had to build these radios out of whatever part she could find in whatever foreign country she happened to be living in and hide them and and then then bring them out and sometimes reassemble them and and she had to communicate using morse code and she had to make a little you know dot 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 talk about the these um you know she wasn't the only obviously person who was transmitting by wireless radio from from very dangerous locations but she wasn't the only woman who was doing that uh and this and this was a very dangerous uh it, it, this was this was particularly dangerous work because of the way in which these signals could be intercepted, right? Uh, and that was a constantly uh, a possibility. Absolutely. I mean, for example, when she was in Manchuria, in the in the city of Mukden, um, she had, she built her radio transmitter. She hid it in a sort of chest in the house, but she had to get an aerial up in order to, to use right. it properly. Right. And she had she has this extraordinary description of climbing onto the roof one night with her baby asleep downstairs and trying to erect on a bamboo pole what was known as a Fuchs area which would run between the two gables. I mean ironically the building was right next door to the German club which was stuffed with Nazis yeah. and, and Japanese yeah. sympathizers. I mean it was incredibly dangerous. I have a photograph actually of the building and you can see the bamboo radio transmitter. It's in the book. You can, you can see the aerial that she put up. I mean, to us these days, it seems a very rustic form of, of, of technology. Right. Then it was the highest of high technology, but it was vulnerable. I mean, there, there were two ways. There were radio interception vans, but there were also the Japanese were running um, aeroplanes to try and triangulate the position. They right. knew there were foreign spies operating in Manchuria. And Ursula knew the stakes. I mean, she knew how close it was. It was even more dangerous, really. I mean, Switzerland was pretty dangerous because the Gestapo were riddling. Um, they, they also knew there were lots of Soviet and British and American spies operating in Switzerland. But in, but in the Cotswolds, particularly in, in Oxfordshire, MI5, the security service of, of, of Great Britain, had radio detection vans which were circling the country for precisely this purpose. They were actually mostly looking for what they felt were the dangers of Nazi um, or German sympathizers sending messages to, 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 to Berlin. But they were also perfectly well aware that Soviet spies were doing it too. And at one point, they got very, very close to us. They, they detected that there was a signal coming from somewhere in the vicinity of this little Oxfordshire village. Um, and they went. Uh, to, in fact, they got as close as, as sort of knocking on Ursula's door. But the, uh, the point that you addressed earlier, the fact that she was a woman gave her really perfect camouflage. I'm sure we'll come back to this again, but there are wonderful, I mean, they're hilarious with hindsight, but the, but the memos inside the MI5 files in which they say, and I'm not exaggerating, it can't be Mrs. Burton. She can't be a spy because she's far too busy with her domestic duties. 
Um, and Ursula knew this. Ursula was, was perfectly able uh, to manipulate and to ruthlessly exploit her gender as her greatest disguise. So I'm sure we'll come back to that in a moment. But yes, I mean, her technical skills were, were formidable, really. Um, but as always in intelligence, and, and you know this very well, Liza, the, the, it, it's really always the interplay between human intelligence and, and signals intelligence. You, you can't have one without the other. In the end, it also comes down, I mean, while you have to be proficient at sending messages and to hiding your own and to disguising your own messages, also a lot of intelligence boils down to relations between human beings. And it, right. it often boils down to looking someone in the eye and trying to work out whether you can trust them. I mean, that's, that's, that's an absolute, that, that was certainly central to the way that Earth's are operating. You know, I'm so glad you brought that up. There were several places in the book where I, I noted in the margin that the um, the combination of human, you know, human intelligence skills and SIGINT or other technical skills. For example, when she's meeting for the first time with Klaus Fuchs, who is going to pass these extraordinary atomic secrets to the Soviet Union, and he's nervous. You say in the book, and when he meets her. She she reassures him through her presence. And I don't know at that point if it's gender or if it's just her innate human skills at, at appearing trustworthy upon a very first meeting. And similarly, when she's passing the secrets, these incredibly um you know, a cutting edge is a cliche. I mean, these these globally significant technologies, she's using brush passes and, you know, the sort of classic human trade craft on the street. You just got to have human instincts for who's around you. This combination of high the highest tech and just the most fundamental human qualities some of which are gender related and some of which are probably just innate but it's it's the moments when those two come together are, are just riveting but right she put, she put, aren't they? i mean sorry no she put things that it is it seems like in their first meeting well Fuchs is absolutely the sort of key figure in in this part of her story i mean Klaus Fuchs was another German uh, refugee. He was a prodigiously talented physicist. He was also a secret communist, so they had that in common. And he, like Ursula, felt that since Britain and America and the Soviet Union were allied in the war, it was unfair, simply unfair, that the Brits and the Americans were jointly and secretly developing this weapon without telling the Soviet Union. It, it was almost that simple, that their, their attitude to it. But you're absolutely right. And, it's the combination of sort of human, that sort of human ability to read people with this technical ability. And the Soviets did an assessment of the Fuchs case after the, after the war, and they worked out 590 different documents were handed over by him in the course of this, this period. Really, they were the blueprints on how, it was, it was really a sort of day-by-day -day account of what was happening, what was codenamed the Tube Alloys Project, because Fuchs had been brought into that. I mean, he was an absolutely central figure in the development of the atomic bomb, but all the time he was feeding it to Ursula. Now, Ursula was, was clever enough to know her own limits as a scientist. She, she, didn't, she never claimed to understand what all this stuff was, and some of it was far too technical for her even to send on the Morse code tapper. So, she, as you say, she had to resort to what seemed to us like incredibly old-fashioned spy techniques for leaving these messages for her Soviet handler, who could then scoop them up, put them in the diplomatic bag, and get them sent to Moscow. But, but human intelligence, like signals intelligence, like all technology, goes wrong sometimes. It just doesn't work sometimes. And there's a moment, one of the moments I like most in this book was that Ursula's dead drop site. Now, a dead drop site is, is where you leave a message for another spy where they can pick them up at a different time. So there is no human contact necessary. So it's a, it's, it's a simple way, it's also known as a dead letterbox. And, and Ursula's dead drop site was the hollow root of a tree, uh, believe it or not, three <laughs> trees from a crossroads after an underpass just outside the village. Now, so there was a period when she was leaving, this was slightly after the Fuchs period, but she was leaving messages for her Soviet handler and they weren't being picked up and she couldn't work out what was going on. And she assumed that something must have gone wrong, that they'd been betrayed or she'd been exposed. And for nearly a year, it went silent. But, but in fact, there was no, it was, it was as always with these stories, it was cock up more than conspiracy. And the, and the Red Army Intelligence Service, this vast and 
an extraordinarily well-funded intelligence gathering machine had got the wrong tree. They simply managed to pick the wrong tree. By coincidence, there was another hollow tree at a different crossroad. They'd gone to that. So, it, so it's one of those moments when everything seems so perfectly planned and then it and then it all falls apart. But so the technical aspects and the human aspects in, entwine in this story in a way that I found very, very satisfying. Really. It's it's wonderful. So let's do talk specifically about how being a woman did help her with her spying and then also help her um, elude capture, uh, even as she experienced the agonies of being a working parent, separations from her children, her beloved children, uh, mm -hmm. and and all the guilt that comes with, you know, having to go away for training and leaving her, leaving her son uh, with his grandparents. And, you know, there's so many times in the book where any working mother, any working parent, <laughs> uh, there's the scene where she's lying awake wondering if she should murder her nanny. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't. Well, I shouldn't say that. She might. But, but yes, no. I mean, in a in a strange way, that was one of the central internal struggles of Ursula's life, and she's she's extraordinarily honest in in assessing her own internal conflict because throughout her life there was a battle going on within Ursula between what she saw as her ideological duty, her political her political commitment to the cause, which was absolute and her human responsibility as a mother and a wife and, and the creator of a sort of domestic world. She had three children, she, as you say, adored them, but the conflict between them and, uh, was, was intense. And we talk about a work-life balance today, particularly for women. Exactly. In, in Ursula's case, the work-life balance is particularly extraordinary because the work is potentially lethal. I mean, it's not just that, that, that she's not just going out to, to work in an office, as we all may do. She, she's going out to work knowing that if she gets caught, she's dead, and yeah. so are her family. I mean, yeah. if the Gestapo had found them in Switzerland and deported them back to Germany, they would all have perished in the, in the, in the death camps. And, and so the stakes couldn't be higher. Right. And Ursula, at the end of her life, I won't say she tortured herself with this, but she certainly, even in her 90s, she was writing... I worry, have I been a good spy, but a bad mother? And for her children, I mean, it's one of the broader facts of this story is that, is that and I, something I've discovered over the years from writing about this area of life, that, that secrets are addictive and secrets are toxic. And spies become addicted to their own secrecy. And that has a damaging effect, not only on individuals, but on the wider people that they interact with. And, and for her children, I think, the discovery, and they were middle-aged before they discovered this, that their mother had been someone completely different from the person that they thought she was, that she, she, had, she had been a secret keeper. And into his 90s, her son, Michael, who I got to know very well, he died um, last year, alas, but at, a, at a great age. In his 90s, he said to me, I never really, I never knew whether I really knew my mother. And so secrets have an effect. They have, a, they can have a long-term damaging effect. But that said, Ursula's role, her, her, if you like, her cover as a wife and a mother served her extraordinarily well. And she knew it. She knew that the more children she had, and she said this, this is in a way quite chilling. She said, the more children I have, the less likely they are to get me. And indeed, her children knew that too. And you can imagine what that would be like. I mean, her daughter said, I, I don't think my mother had us as part of her spy story. But the mere fact that her daughter was even considering that possibility was to me a sign that it had certainly crossed her mind. So you've got, a, you've got an extraordinary conflict going on in someone here. Uh, but I should have got away with it. I mean, the astonishing thing is that the Chinese secret police, the Japanese secret police, the Gestapo, the FBI, M5 and MI6, none of them got onto her. And that is in large part because she was a woman. In the book I write, and that it, was, it would probably have taken a woman to spot, to see through Ursula's disguise. And by happy um, serendipity, there was one woman in MI5, a, a one senior officer in MI5, a, a woman um, who went by the unimprovable name of Millicent Baggett. Now, Millicent Baggett was exactly what you would want Millicent Baggett to be. Uh, she was a formidable, unmarried lady of very strong opinions who did not 
take fools lightly and, and didn't tolerate any nonsense from men. And, and Millicent Bagan was in the anti-Soviet communist hunting section of MI5. And she was repeatedly saying to her male bosses and colleagues, there's something about Mrs. Burton, there's something about Ursula Kaczynski that doesn't smell right. We need to, we need to get onto her, we need to look into her, we need to sort of find out what, and, and she was ignored. Like many women in, in, in male dominated worlds, she was sort of patted on the head and told to not, not to worry, to mind her own business. And, but Millicent Baggett, she may have not won that round, but she did achieve a kind of literary immortality because um, she was actually the model for Connie Sachs in John le Carre's uh, fiction. John, uh, David Cornwall, to give him his real name, worked with uh, Millicent Baggett in MI5, knew her quite well, and was, like most of her colleagues, absolutely terrified of her. Um, and um, so she did, she did achieve immortality in that respect. Do you know, did she come out of, uh, Millicent, did she come out of World War II or was, did she predate, uh, was she brought on even before? Um... She was actually brought on before. She was actually in a special branch of that, which is the Metropolitan Police Special Branch Division, which, which oh, sort okay. of, in a way crosses over partly into yeah. intelligence. And yeah. then, then before the war, in fact, but she was, she was rare. I mean, there were very, very few. I mean, I, I, I know them personnel quite well now, and I would say you could probably count on one hand the yeah. number of officers. There were plenty of secretaries. Right. I mean, that was, that was the way it worked. But as you said at the top of the programme, this was war, as in so many areas of life, was an opportunity for supremely talented women to get ahead and be treated as equals. What I've always felt about the Ursula story is that in a way, the, the reason we don't know about her or haven't known about her up until this point is that Historians have also tended to overlook her um, because she was a woman. I think it's I think I think that ingrained sense of kind of the inequality of the of, of the genders. Really, historians have a responsibility for it too. And we are hearing more and more about the and it, does, it we're not sort of turning them into heroines. Ursula is not a kind of plastic female James Bond with a pistol in her purse. She's not you know she's she's a much more interesting and complicated character than that. Um, but yet she is someone who was able to, to deal with men as equals. I don't think Ursula would ever have described herself as a feminist. It's quite interesting, even though Agnes Smedley certainly was. I think Ursula never really thought about it that way. I think she just believed that she was perfectly capable of doing whatever a man could do. But she wasn't terribly interested in the role of women in wider society. She wasn't sort of campaigning in that way. She was just doing something that she turned out to be incredibly good at. Yes. And in terms of that's that's just extraordinary. Um, and, and I do think Agnes Smedley is representative of, of sort of the women of the 1920s and 30s who the the suffragist generation, the uh, the sort of the flapper, the new woman, um, mm. that kind of brief window of emancipation uh, that happened at the beginning of the 20th century. Agnes seemed to me to, to come out of that era, uh, you know, that gave us Amelia Earhart and, and some of the other famous kind of dashing uh, women. Um, but it, it just to, that's just an aside, uh, one of the other things that struck me when you were talking about Millicent Baggett and, uh, and her male uh, colleagues and superiors who were on to Ursula, uh, but couldn't quite nail her. And, uh, and I, I was struck by how Millicent, um, she was sort of in charge of her bureau, but they gave her a male boss just because it was thought that <laughs> Uh, yeah. that she, she couldn't actually be the boss, even though she was the brains of the operation. And, and, and even she, I think it's fair to say, but certainly her male colleagues and superiors, when they would look at Ursula's household, they would look at her, they would focus on her male partner. Uh, and so in a way, her, her spy activities were not only endangering her children at times and her family, but the man who, <laughs> whatever male partner she had at the time also yep. came under extra suspicion because she and was- course, she was. There's, there's a great irony there because yeah. they certainly suspected her husband, Len, who had a history of communism, who was a Brit, who was a man. Right. Um, and of course, what they didn't know was that Len was actually her recruit. That, that Len was her under, underly. I mean, he was, right. he was under her command. She had recruited him back during the war. She then married him in order to get a passport. She then accidentally fell in love with him and stayed married to him. And it was a very happy marriage. They stayed married for yeah. 50 years. 
but what am I five never I mean they were totally focused on Len Burton who was actually by far the minor figure in this okay. story I mean Len was lovely but he was actually pretty hopeless he, was fine. Right. he, wasn't, he wasn't very good but and I also sort of knew this and, and there was a wonderful moment when the final time that MI5 came to interview the Burtons in their cottage they knocked on the door and Ursula answered it wearing a kind of an apron um, and she was doing some baking in the back for Christmas yeah. for a birthday cake for her son. And the first thing she said to the MI5 officers was, oh, shall I, shall I go and get my husband? Yes, yes, um, yes. Which was yes. brilliant. And they sort of said, oh, yes, madam, you should probably do that. And they were, they were to give them their credit, I mean, these, these old fashioned British intelligence officers with sort of droopy moustaches were, were, were just cripplingly embarrassed to be interviewing a wife and a mother as a potential spy. It just didn't, it just didn't compute for them. Um, but they did, they kind of got onto her in the end, but she she got away nonetheless. I won't give that away for the for the readers, but she 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 was quite she was very canny. She was very she knew how to run the story, the cover story, better than they were ever going to get to, I think. Right. And these these um I have to say, I mean, hapless, uh, the word that you use, also her first husband, Rudy. Uh, Hamburger is just a tragic figure, but I, God, these, honestly, these men who partner with her in these extraordinary situations, uh, it's just, it, it, it's hard to know how to think about it. They just keep making one mistake after another. I mean, she's obviously, they fall, all these men fall for her and, and agree to these extraordinary conditions sort of for living with her that. Mm -hmm. I mean, she had an extraordinary allure, Ursula. She wasn't, she wasn't promiscuous. No, um, well. And she wasn't a seductress. You know, we have this idea of a kind right. of honey trap female She wasn't a honey trap, yeah. But she, but she was much more, she, she would, she fell in love when she fell in love and, and, and she fell in love absolutely I, she wasn't promiscuous and yet you're right the men were that in her lives were never up to her grade really that was that was part of the problem i think is she she was always a much more powerful personality than than they were and and rudy her first husband is a is a, it's actually a, it's an incredibly tragic story i mean yeah. to really to try and keep up with ursula he converted to communism and then decided that he wanted to be a spy. Um, and it was really his way of kind of keeping in with her. Mm -hmm. but, but the problem was he was absolutely useless at it. He, he yes. couldn't do it and he kept getting caught. And the poor man did in fact end up in the, in the Soviet gulag. I mean, his story is a, is a terrible one. Yes. But, but it's, again, and, and, and there's a tough side to Ursula. I mean, that's the other element of her personality that I think is, is both alluring and in some ways, rather chilling. I mean, she's a great combination of parts, Ursula. She's not a simple one-dimensional black and white heroine at all. And I, you know, she made some terrible mistakes and she ended up on the wrong side of history. But she had a kind of toughness, a kind of determination that I think came from having witnessed some of the worst parts of 20th century history. She was tough as only that kind of brutal world could make a person and so she's a great combination of tenderness and toughness and i think that makes her makes her very remarkable i think mm -hmm. yes absolutely and and what you what you said is she she never did play that classic when when people think of women in espionage they often do think of the honey trap i think which is i mean you you just 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 you you can define that uh better than i can probably but but she really would never was that for all of her illicit affairs and things like that she was she didn't play that what people think of as the kind of traditional role for a woman right no i mean the honey trap is the classic sort of woman who seduces a man into bed and then extracts secrets from them in the form of pillow talk. pillow talk yeah that's that was not her way she was not above using her her feminine um uh, attractiveness to get men to tell her things but but more it was that she was playing the part of a slightly dotty housewife in Shanghai saying to the German ambassador, oh, have you got, you know, how many guns do you think you're going to be, you know, it was sort of, there was, she was sort of playing the, the, the sort of, the, the naive, if you like. Right, it wasn't, it wasn't a man's yeah. Yeah. yeah, but, but I did, a seductress she wasn't. Right. Um, but she, she knew that she had an electric effect on, on, on women as well as men. I mean, it may well be that she and Agnes Smedley were lovers. Agnes Smedley was certainly bisexual. And and their their relationship was highly charged. 
um, and, and highly the way they wrote to each other was semi erotic. It's very interesting. So who knows? Who knows? I mean, it, it's not clear, but it was a time really of sexual liberation too. And Ursula, without sort of formalizing it as a political statement, was under no illusions that, about whether or not she was, you know, she was quite happy in a way to live this life that was, you know, that even the Stasi, even the East German secret police, when they discovered that she had three children by three different men and, and she wanted to write about it as a prudish organization, they said, no, you can't possibly do that. Um, you know, that it's, you know, we, we need you to be a pure heroine of the Soviet Union. So um, she's complicated. Oh, so complicated. And and just as you say, she, well, she, she doesn't typically work as a honey trap. The, the time that, that uh, did strike me where she employed some uh, flirtatious skills, survival skills, is when she's literally living next to a Nazi. She's living next to that big Nazi and has to sort of jolly him up. And uh, so she flirts with him a little bit uh, just to put him off her scent, because I think that that's another case where she's got an aerial coming out of her house or something. Um, and so that that struck me as impressive. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah no, I mean, and, and she sort of knew what she was doing. And um, amusingly enough, the Nazi who lived next door, I think he also knew what was going on, but he was rather smitten by yeah. Ursula. And yeah. so he, yeah. you know, again, it's that interplay, I think, of the human with the political that, I, that I've always found fascinating. What and, 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 and Ursula's life asks, in a way, more insistently than any book I've ever written, actually. I think it asks, what would you do? What would you as an individual have done in these circumstances? Would you, you know, and to do that, you have to kind of understand that the context of Ursula's life, you know, that where her communism came from. We think of communism, obviously, these days, we think of it as being a failed idea that went disastrously wrong and, and caused untold human misery. She didn't know that at the time that she was a communist. And her life in a way, and I'm not trying to make it for her, you know, she served a brutal, philistine, repressive regime. But as she said in later life, I didn't do it for Stalin. I and mean, when she discovered the extent of Stalin's crime, she was horrified. When she discovered how many of her friends and colleagues had been wiped out by him, she was furious. But yet she stuck to the idea. And in a way, that's what makes her life so extraordinary. She was very young when the Bolshevik Revolution took place. And she was very old when the Berlin Wall came down. Mm -hmm. So her life spans the whole of communism in, from its sort of, as it were, crystal ideological beginnings to its chaotic, right. sclerotic collapse in the era we all know. And, and so in a way, her story is the story of communism in all its complexity and confusion. Mm -hmm and brutality, and, 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 and I think she knew that. She died, in many ways, I think a disappointed woman. I think she knew that many of the truths that she had stuck to all her life had in fact been lies, which may, again gives a kind of perspective on her life that I think is, is, is unique actually. And, and I'm looking at questions that have been submitted by listeners, and, and I would encourage anybody listening to go ahead and submit a question, um, please. And uh, there, there was a, is a question about the purges and her knowledge of the purges, because it didn't completely come as a surprise to her late in life. She did sort of see what was happening, right? It's the one question that I would love to have asked Ursula myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, the journalist in me would love to have sat down with her and said, how much did you really know about the right. purges? Now, the purges were the terrible Stalinist, murderous, paranoid moments in 37 30, and 38, when hundreds of thousands of people were wiped out, particularly spies, particularly foreign, particularly Jews. You know, so Ursula was herself a major target. And one by one, and she was in Moscow for, for part of this period. One by one, her friends and colleagues were picked off. Now, it, subsequently, she wrote about it. She claimed she didn't really know what was going on, that no one really knew what was going on, that she was horrified when she discovered. But actually, it's the period of Ursula's life that I find most queasy um, to write about, because I think she did something that is probably more human than that. I think she... She, like everybody, she knew it was incredibly dangerous. She knew that there was this terrible, murderous, 
sort of uh, assault going on with people that she knew, and she just didn't want to see it. She, right. she closed her eyes, she turned her back, and she got out of Moscow as fast as she could because she knew she was she was not going to survive herself. But that she did survive is one of the great mysteries of this story. I mean, I think it is probably down to her ability to invoke to inspire a certain sort of loyalty and just simple luck. She got incredibly lucky, but but it was a crisis for her, and it would continue to be a kind of psychological wound for her into late, late life. Even in her 90s, she was wrestling with the idea that she had served a murderous tyrant who had killed many, many of her friends. Now, she made accommodation with that. She made accommodation with that for the sake of the idea that she still believed was a good one. And she went to her, to her deathbed, a communist. Was she wrong? Yes, she was wrong. But that, that, you can't really judge history like that. History is not a question of right and wrong and black and white. Most of history, I believe, is painted in gray, in shades of moral gray. And, and if you try to impose a kind of moral straight jacket on the past, we're, we're misunderstanding what human experience is about. All you can try to do with these stories is to put people into their context and try to see it as they saw it. You don't have to agree with it, but you have to be able to see it through their eyes. And it, again, as I say, it raises the question, what would you do? I wonder if you and I, Lisa, had been young people in the Weimar Republic in the 1920s and fascism had been on the rise, we might well have become communists. Sure. Whether we would have stuck to communism right. throughout its Stalinist era, that's another whole question. But, but you know, those are, those are the questions that animate me and I think that, that make history important and interesting. One of the questions that was submitted was, is there anything about Ursula that still nags at you? Anything that you, um, it, it, and, and I think you've just given your answer, but is, is, there, is there anything else that you- that Yes, you... I mean, there are moments, there are other moments when I question Ursula, Ursula painted herself in later life as a pure driven product of belief, of ideology. She looked at her choices, and, and framed them as if they were the logical result of conviction, which spies often do, actually. I mean, they, 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 I've never come across a spy who didn't believe they were serving a higher cause, a, a good one. But actually, most spies are motivated by all sorts of different um, uh, feelings and instincts, including hubris and ambition and, and love of adventure, love of danger in Ursula's case. Those were all part of her story, you know. And I, I'd loved if I'd love to have sat down with her. And, and, and there are other moments, you know, for example, when when the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany forged the notorious Molotov Ribbentrop Pact um, before the Soviets came into the war, the non-aggression pact between yep. Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. I mean, that was a terrible moment for Ursula because right. she had, you know, the cause that she had espoused all her adult life was anti-fascism. She kept, you know, she became a communist to destroy people like Hitler. Indeed, she at one point framed up an assassination plot mm -hmm. to kill him that very nearly happened. Mm -hmm. And then this moment came when out of the grimiest kind of real poverty, the people that she believed in were suddenly in bed with the people that she despised. And that was another crisis for her. And yet, in her own story, she rather smooths over it because she's writing for an East German communist audience. She doesn't really address that issue, but we know from others that it was, again, it was a moment of profound doubt for her. She presented herself as a pure driven communist. And again, I would love to have interrogated her a bit harder on that. You know, yeah. where, did, where were the moments? And we know in later life, there were others, the Hungarian uprising crushed in 1956 the Prague Spring destroyed by the Soviet tanks in 1968. We know, I know from her sons that these were for, for her moments of real internal ideological crisis. But again, in the official record, you can't, you can't quite get her to, to admit what was really going on inside her, inside her soul. And so there, there are moments that I would like to just have pressed, pressed her a bit harder. 
Well, I, I'll just say though, your your ability to um, to get access to her writings and her letters, and I mean, I think you come as close as it is possible for an historian, a biographer to come to talk about her internal life and her thoughts and her evolution. So, I, well, I was very lucky, Liza. I mean, the truth is, I got hugely lucky. I, I, I couldn't have written this book without the cooperation of her two surviving sons, who were both brought up in East Germany. One of them was a communist, you know, and, and so this Western figure arrived saying, I'm gonna write the story of your mother's life. They looked at me initially and understandably with considerable suspicion. But uh, over time, they said, look, we've got these letters, we've got these diaries, we've got these unpublished manuscripts that our mother wrote, help yourself. And it's very rare to find that, to find, yeah. to find a family. Right. Families all preserve the mythology of their, of their, of their ancestors, particularly of their parents. And, and they, were, they were absolutely wonderful about it. They just said, help yourself, write whatever you want. And so I also had, but I was also very lucky in the sense that Ursula became, in later life, much later life, she, she reinvented herself as a novelist. She wrote a number of highly successful books for young adults. Uh, they sold in the hundreds of thousands. And they are, they're described, or were described as fiction. But the reality is that they're not really fiction, they're memoir. They were Ursula's ways of getting around the Stasi censors. Mm. And so again, in discussion with her sons, they said, look, th this isn't really, this isn't fiction, this is memoir. And you may treat this as Ursula's beliefs and feelings and her thoughts. So I was able, I was just incredibly lucky. I was able to excavate what Ursula was thinking and feeling at, at key points of her life. So it, it was a frustrating experience because, you know, you I took on a book like this with some trepidation for two reasons, really. One is that Ursula was a communist. I'm not a communist. So, you know, being in the company of a communist for three years, I took on with some, you know, communists can be quite didactic. They can be quite finger waggy and tough. Actually, I found her incredibly good company. Mm -hmm. And also she's a woman and I, you know, to, to, to ventriloquize, for a man to ventriloquize a, a woman at the moment, if that's the right word, to interpret is a is a tricky thing to do in the kind of world that we're in at the moment. But because I had access to these extraordinarily unpublished manuscripts and her memoir, I always felt that Ursula was somehow, in a way, there with me, and that I could I could say what she was feeling without without certainly doing any violation to the truth, but knowing that I was in some way echoing her own her own psychology and her own psyche in some way. Well, can I just say, I don't believe in luck in those instances. It's your human skills at, 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 at uh, helping, at, they, they understood that they were working with a biographer that, that who merited the handing over of, of these records. So just make that, it wasn't, it well, wasn't that, luck. Any more than, you know, you. her survival was luck. But let's just, I, I can't resist asking you in, in terms of the end of her life and her survival skills and gender and the way, the role that gender played and people's assumptions about women played in her survival. Talk about the moment when Ricard Sorge is being asked about her as he is going to be hanged. And yes, this is one of those really extraordinary moments in her story. I mean, Ricard Sorge was really the love of her life. I mean, he, she, she married twice. She had three children by three different men. But Sorge's was the photograph that she, she, was, she took with her for the rest of her life. It was hanging on the wall in the room where she died. So, so he was there with her. Even though their love affair was, was very brief, but Sorge was captured by the Japanese. I mean, having a, pulled off a, astonishing feats during the war. I mean, he even managed to warn Stalin of Operation Barbarossa, of the, of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. I mean, he had access to the highest echelons of Japanese imperial and political, the imperial and political world. But he was eventually captured, as all spies, most spies are, and he was betrayed and he was caught. And he was asked about women intelligence spies you know he, when he was being interrogated and he was as you say convicted and eventually hanged in, in a tokyo prison and it's very interesting because he said women spies are hopeless they are they're I mean, i'm paraphrasing because i can't remember the exact words he was using but he said you know i've never used women spies i've always felt that they really you know they were no use and of course that was completely untrue of him i mean not only had he recruited us he recruited other women um but it, that moment was Sorge covering for Ursula. Right. He was, you know, to the death, 
he was not going to expose her. And so he was laying a false trail, knowing that, that no one was, you know, that, that it was a way of covering up. Because he had no idea how senior she'd become. Right. But he did know that she was still in the Soviet intelligence service. He knew that the Japanese knew that he'd been in contact with her in right. Shanghai. He also knew that they knew that she'd been in Japanese occupied Manchuria. And so he deliberately, it was almost the last act he made, right. was, to, was to point them off the trail. I found that extraordinarily moving. Oh. I don't know if Ursula ever knew it. I oh. don't know if she knew that because those interrogation records had not been released, I think, at the time that Ursula died. She was 93, but but even so, I think they were released in the early 2000s. So I don't think she ever knew that his last act was to kind of protect her before the hangman took him away. Well, I salute your your uh, your your research skills. You know that you got, got her letters and that depth of understanding of her, as well as those interrogation records and. Uh, and it's it's so re research in this terrain is so difficult. Getting people spies generally don't write things down, and, and governments don't want to hand over these records often. And that you were able to get both you know her inner thoughts and moments like that uh, is just uh, well. Again, I think it's. I mean, you're right. Spies don't usually write about what's happened, and when they do, they tend to kind of bend the truth slightly. Mm. I mean, half the fun about, about writing about spies is trying to work out where the truth lies, mm -hmm. as distinct from what they pretend the truth was. So you've always got to kind of aim off a bit. But in a funny way, when you, when you do have the intelligence files, when you do have first person accounts, when you do have letters and diaries, and budget, you can, it's possible in the espionage world, I, I hope, to write a book that feels like fiction, that has as, that has as much detail as, as a novel would and yet it's all true and so you know I, I never make anything up I, if I say the sky was blue and there were cornflowers in the fields that's because I've got a witness saying that that what was there and, and sometimes and as, I was, as I say very lucky you have enough material to be able to tell a story where the narrative moves along in a way that feels almost novel like and yet it's true and I think it's no accident in a way that Ursula became a novelist in her later life, that so many spies have ended up as novelists. John le Carre is a very good example. Um, Somerset Maugham, even, uh, you know, um, Ian Fleming, uh, John Buchan, they were all, John uh, Graham Greene, they were all spies before they became novelists. But I think there isn't such a big jump between being a spy and being a novelist. They're both, in a way, about imagination. They're both about creating an artificial and believable world and trying to lure other people into it. And so I think I, I, I've always found fascinating the sort of interplay between espionage, intelligence, and fiction, and writing of fiction. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. Uh, and we're a little bit over time, so I think I should wrap it up. I also just wanted to say hello from, uh, from Stephen McKinnon, who is Agnes Smedley's biographer and wasn't able to submit questions, but wanted to congratulate you on, on your wonderful book. And uh, next, I want to read his biography of Agnes Smedley. These, this is just so wonderful. Thank you so much for writing the book. And thank you so much for, uh, for the time that you've given all of us. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you very much for having me.